everybody. Thank you for joining the ACA Small Business Bootcamp and Resource Collective for this Thursday morning, July 30th. I'm Robert Theobald, the Small Business Ombudsman and Vice President of Small Business Services here at the Arizona Commerce Authority. Uh, we're excited to have this session today and we're grateful that you guys can all join us. Uh, we want to start by thanking all of our community partners. These boot camp sessions could not be completed without their support, their content, and their expertise. So we thank them very much. Small Business Boot Camp is a resource to help small businesses emerge from the COVID crisis stronger than ever. It's a statewide initiative supported by our community partners, and it is a daily boot camp that we are running daily through the end of this month, so today and tomorrow. And then starting next week, we are going to a two day, two to three days a week uh, program uh, that is going to have continued great content. So we will be starting up next week. Sessions will be on Tuesday uh, and Friday. So we have some great uh, sessions lined up for next week as well. Uh, as long with a great session tomorrow. So the Small Business Boot Camp and Resource Collective, as we said, have been going Monday through Friday since the beginning of May. All the previous sessions are recorded and available on our Small Business Boot Camp website. Under the archive, you can access all of those previous presentations and the corresponding slide decks for them. Uh, there's a great group of sessions. If you've missed one, you can go back and review it and uh, watch it or if you can't quite make it at 9 a.m. the session is recorded and will be available later in the day. Additionally, all the resources that our community partners are providing to support their presentations and support small businesses are available on our resource collective. Uh, this is a great tool to help all small businesses uh, see the resources that are available to them. So as you mentioned this week, we've had some great sessions thus far and, and we still have some great sessions to go. We have practical strategies to lead your company through COVID-19 on Monday. Tuesday was how the community can best support small businesses. Wednesday, yesterday was removing friction from your business. Uh, I will say if you missed that session, go back and watch it. It has 10, uh, 10 pointers to, to help your business. It, it was a very good session. Um, today we have a great session planned by Carrie Ann Todd on update on um, the Paycheck Protection Program. And then tomorrow, we have using finance to grow your business. So some quick updates. Uh, there's still, if you haven't got a PPP loan, there is still money available. The program ends on August 8th. It was extended through August 8th. Um, and as you can see, Arizona has received a lot of PPP uh, funding and EIDL funding for their businesses to, in the terms of about $11 billion. Uh, I also want to note that there are some localities, some municipalities that have grant programs available through CARES Act funding, and many of those communities have funds still available in the programs. I know I heard that Phoenix, there was an article yesterday uh, that Phoenix, if you're in Phoenix, there's still quite a bit of funding left in their grant program. So if you're a Phoenix small business, uh, I would take a look at that. Uh, there are a number of other communities. And we have many of those listed on our resource collective as well. So some of the tools that are available and programs available for small businesses are small business services here at the ACA. We can help you work with the SBA, work with the Small Business Development Center, SCORE, and other resources for small businesses across the state. Our workforce division, uh, Arizona at Work, can help with hiring your employees if you're looking for to grow your business. They can also work with training programs. Uh, they have multiple training opportunities uh, for businesses out there. Um, and then our Arizona MEP, our Manufacturing Extension Partnership, is a great resource for small to medium-sized manufacturers looking to grow and expand their business. Quick shout out and reminder of the ArizonaTogether.org website for all things related to COVID-19. And again, this is just a list of our guides that are available on our, on our resource collective to help uh, businesses work through COVID-19. So our COVID-19 Arizona resource business page is our go-to place for all business resources for COVID-19 related items. Uh, we update it constantly, so uh, please take a look at that if you have not. And so today's speaker, we have Carrie Ann Todd from Beach Fleischman. She's been with us before. She's one of our experts on PPP, and we're excited to have her back again to share some updates that she's put together. So Carrie Ann, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and turn the time over to you. 
All right, let me get my screen going here. All right, is that the right screen, Robert? Yes. Okay. All right, so thanks again for having me at the um, Arizona Commerce Authority. Um, I've been here several times before, and I'm just going to kind of make a comment about the number of attendees. Um, I, th I think everyone, if you're like me, you're kind of like ready for a PPP to maybe be over. Um, and so I feel that too. I feel like the kind of the, ex maybe the excitement about the program that we all felt um, at the very beginning is kind of waning and everyone is just at a point where they really just want to know what the answers are so they can file for forgiveness, get through the process and be done with it. Um, so I, I wrote an article about that on my LinkedIn page a few weeks ago. Um, and, and I think it's, it's ongoing. So, if that's how you feel, you're not alone. Um, this, this program has been challenging. Um, it's, a, it's a great program in concept. The practical application of it has been challenging. And so hopefully um, we'll spend some time today and kind of talk through those things, what's still out there, what's open, um, and, and help you out in this, in this time when we're all still sort of waiting, but sort of ready to get going. Um, okay. Just so you know, this presentation is as of today. So everything in these slides is gonna be based on what we know today. And I kind of emphasize that because things are constantly changing. Um, Senator Rubio, who's the chairman of the Small Business Committee in the Senate, introduced new legislation on Monday, I believe. And if that legislation goes through, it's gonna change the program again, which I know everyone is excited about. Um, but the good news in the program, in, in what he is proposing, and if I believe if you Google online, if you, uh, if you try to read the actual bill, it's like 92 pages, I probably wouldn't recommend that. But you can find a summary that's about seven pages. And one of his propositions is really reducing the paperwork burden on anyone who received a loan less than $150,000 which I think is welcome relief for everyone. Um, if they use that threshold, it will cover about 85% of the loans that have been issued. Not 85% of the dollars, but it will cover 85% of the actual businesses that got a PPP loan. So if you can imagine, that takes a huge burden off of those businesses themselves, um, off of the lenders who are having to process the forgiveness applications, and then also in turn on the SBA, because as we'll talk about later, um, the SBA has ultimate say on all of these forgiveness applications. So um, hold tight, this is what we know as of today. And then um, Robert just talked me into doing another session in August. So hopefully by then, if there's gonna be new legislation, it will be in place and we'll know what it is and we can all move forward from that point. Okay, so we're gonna kind of go through some different things. If you've listened to me on here before, I've, I've really focused more on the rules. How does this work? How does that work? How does this work? Um, so today I wanna kind of talk about maybe some different things that you wanna focus on now that we're down the line, things you may not have thought about, um, talk a lot about what we still don't know. Um, and then at the end, still have an open forum that's at least 20 minutes, if not more, where you can ask whatever question you want. It doesn't even have to be about one of the slides. If you have just a PPP question, um, feel free to ask that at the end. So, um, okay, eligibility certification. So while this may not be specific to this audience, if you're a small business, um, there's a huge spotlight on the certification because Congress is really concerned about fraud and making sure that anyone who got a PPP loan met the requirements and quote needed a PPP loan even though we can all agree and they'll concede the fact that they didn't really define what need is at the very beginning when they um, instituted the CARES Act. So with respect to that certification um, we are recommending to all of our clients that they prepare a formal written document and when I say formal I basically just mean written printed and signed um, that spells out exactly what you were considering when you decided to apply for the PPP program. 
what was going on in your business. And I've kind of given a list of factors to consider when you're writing that memo. You don't have to engage an attorney. This doesn't have to be some big fancy thing. You can write it yourself. You know your business. You know what you were thinking. So just write a memo to your file. You know, what was going on in your industry? What was going on with your employees? You know, were there any outbreaks? Were, you know, did you have any employees that were infected? Did you have employees that travel all the time? So you had a greater concern about that. Were you concerned about your supply chain? Um, depending on what business you were in, where you get your materials, were you concerned that the supply chain was going to affect your ability to function normally? Um, are you a general contractor or a subcontractor? Those, into, those, they have different concerns, right? Um, what was the status of your contracts? Were they set in stone or were there escape clauses where maybe you had a contract and you were working on it, but at any given time, the owner would be able to say, wait a minute, we got to stop. Um, or they could get out of the contract completely. How does social distancing affect your business specifically? Um, if you're in a restaurant, if you own a restaurant, that's a completely different answer than let's say if you own a law firm. Um, they still affect both industries and both companies, but they affect you differently. You, were you concerned about your AR, about being able to collect on your AR? So many factors, right, that were out there. So just write all that down um, as a narrative as documentation of all the things you were thinking about when you applied for the PPP loan. Now there is a safe harbor out there for anyone who got a loan less than 2 million. And so most of you may qualify for that. And under the safe harbor, they're gonna deem to have met, you're gonna be deemed to have met the good faith certification. I said, we still think it's a good idea for you to do the memo. Um, even, in, even in Senator Rubio's proposed legislation, one of the bullet points even with respect to the loans less than $150,000, where they're trying to make it much easier to get 100% forgiveness, they still threw in a caveat that the SBA can audit if they're concerned about fraud. So because of that, and just because of the nature of the society we live in that's very litigious, um, and all the unknowns and the craziness of this program, it's just really a best practice to have that memo in your files. So, and when you sign your forgiveness application, you have to attest one more time that you are eligible for the PPP loan. And this is a snapshot from the uh, regular application. And you can see here, it says, uh, I understand that the SBA may request additional information for the purposes of evaluating my eligibility for a PPP loan in the first place. So they're kind of coming full circle with the certification and saying, hey, we know you certified up front, we're going to make you certify one more time on the back end that you indeed were eligible for the PPP loan. Um, if during the course of its review, whatever review that is, which I'm assuming it means it's review after your lender looks at your forgiveness application, the SBA is going to look at your forgiveness application. If during that review they determine that you were ineligible for some reason, the loan is no longer eligible for forgiveness. It'll have to be repaid. So I say all that just to kind of remind you that the certification thing is still out there. Um, so just kind of do that documentation now while it's fresh. The worst, you know, it's kind of like everybody knows that their tax return is subject to IRS audit. If you knew you were going to get audited by the IRS, your documentation might be different for your tax return than it is if you're kind of playing the odds, hoping you don't get audited. So let's play the odds the other way and think, well, you know, be prepared thinking you might get audited or someone might ask for some of that and just have that documentation now. All right. Um, as far as the loan itself, for those of you who have received a loan, you know you signed a full set of legally binding loan documents when you got the loan. So it's important that you recognize that even though eventually the expectation is that you're gonna get forgiveness, right now you're still under a legally binding set of loan documents. Um, I know that if you went through some of the online lenders or if you went to a non-traditional lending source, you may not have seen those legally binding loan documents. Um, 
But if you went through one of the, um, maybe the national lenders, the bigger banks, the local banks, most of them sent these to you. And they look like just a normal loan. They look just like the same documents you get if you go get an equipment loan or you get a real estate loan. So keep in mind that those are still binding. Um, in those documents themselves, they provide for the start of payments seven months from the loan date. And they did that with the expectation that everyone would be on an eight week covered period, forgiveness would happen quickly, and this would all be resolved within seven months. Um, when the Flexibility Act came out and added an additional 24 week covered period, it extends the timeline. So um, all of those loans, which as a side note are out there as having a two year maturity, um, you can renegotiate with your lender if you need to, but the lender's not obligated to renegotiate. But when that Flexibility Act came out, they extended the payment deferral period to the date that the SBA remits the forgiveness amount to the lender. Um, so it may be within seven months, um, but regardless of what those loan documents say, recognize that the Flexibility Act extended that. That's gonna be important for those of you who, for 1231 or an interim period, if you're a fiscal year company, if you have to prepare financial statements, um, like a full set under uh, generally accepted accounting principles with disclosures and all that, um, your CPA is gonna to need to know that. So they're gonna want, they're gonna to need to disclose the terms of the loan you signed and also disclose the fact that the Flexibility Act has extended that in a general discussion of your PPP loan in the first place. Um, the SBA says in uh, their last interim final rule, which was June 22nd, the one of any substance anyway, um, that they will remit the accrued interest on the forgiven portion of the loan. And so, but while they didn't say it, it infers that the borrower will have to pay the accrued interest on any unforgiven portion. So that interest is still accruing at 1%. So it's, it's not a ton of interest. Um, but just a reminder that it is still accruing, and if any portion of your loan is not forgiven, you're going to have to pay that accrued interest and then make payments on the loan. So, you know, most people are thinking, oh, well, I'm going to get 100% forgiveness. I'm not going to end up with a loan. Well, there's a situation where you might end up with a loan, um, and it's if you got an EIDL grant. Sometimes this was referred to as a grant. Sometimes it was referred to as an advance. Um, this was the program that was very early on under EIDL, and it was $1,000 per employee up to $10,000. And you went online, I remember looking at the application early on, it was a very short little application, and within a few weeks you got an um, EFT in your bank account. So if you received one of those, and you have a PPP loan, you're going to end up with technically not getting 100% forgiveness. And it's because of this provision here in the um, CARES Act. And just a reminder, I'm not talking about EIDL loans. That's completely separate. That has nothing to do with this. This is just the grant or advance that you might have received back in April, maybe May. Um, and for this is a little snippet from the interim final rule on July, uh, June 22nd. And it says, if applicable, SBA will deduct EIDL advance amounts from the forgiveness amount remitted to the lender as required by Section 1110E6 of the CARES Act. So what that means is you could end up with a PPP loan equal to the amount of your EIDL grant. Okay, so just be prepared for that. Um, it's still at the same 1%, has the same two-year terms or five-year terms if you got it up, if you got your loan after June 5th. Um, but that's just something to be aware of. So how the process will work is the lender has 60 days to approve or deny your forgiveness application. Um, there are some very small banks that are accepting paper applications right now, but none of the large lenders that I've communicated with will call them the national, and I don't mean national bank, but national with a lowercase n. Um, none of them have opened their portals that I'm aware of. Um, I'm hearing maybe early August, mid-August, when the lenders are going to be ready to accept applications paperlessly through their website. Um, if you are with a smaller lender that is going to accept a paper application, um, you know, you just need to be in contact with them about how that's going to work. Because ultimately, all the lenders 
have to send the application in some format, no one knows yet, to the SBA. And the SBA um, then has 90 days to approve or deny your forgiveness application and remit funds to the lender. So that's kind of the timeline we're working with. Your lender has 60 days. Hopefully they don't take all 60 days, right? And then the SBA has 90 days. Who knows how long they're gonna take. They'll probably take them longer for the ones on the front end and shorter for the ones on the back end, just like the application process. So what else we know about that is that that SBA portal I talked about is not open yet. Um, they sent a procedural notice to all lenders last week, July 23rd, and it says the portal, the SBA portal will open on August 10th, comma, and this is a direct quote from that notice, subject to extension if any new legislative amendments to the forgiveness process necessitate changes to the system. So just knowing that Senator Rubio introduced that bill on Monday, there's obviously legislation in process. So I, I personally would be surprised if the SBA portal opens on August 10th. Um, but I'm a little bit cynical based on how slowly the SBA has been to give us guidance and the information that we need. Uh, but I wanted to let you know that this is out there. So let's talk about a hypothetical best case scenario. And we're talking like literally best case scenario. Everyone does what they're supposed to do. There's no glitches in the system and everyone opens on time. So if you were to submit your application to the lender on August 1st and your lender is, you know, Johnny on the spot and they approve it and submit it to the SBA when the portal opens on August 10th, assuming that happens, 90 days from August 10th is November 18th. So by law in the interim final rule um, and in the CARES Act, the SBA has 90 days to approve. So in theory, right, this will all be wrapped up in a nice little bow before 1231. I think the odds of that happening for a lot of people are pretty slim, um, just because there's gonna be delays to the system due to this pending legislation. So all that, while we all want it to be wrapped up as soon as possible, I think we need to be prepared for the fact that it might not be. And what are the ramifications of that for our financial statements and our tax returns? Um, and we'll talk about the tax implications in a little bit. Okay. If you have other loans, let's say you have a line of credit, you have an equipment loan, a real estate loan, you might have covenants in those loan agreements. And covenants can be something like you have to have a certain current ratio as of an, a quarterly measurement date, or maybe they only measure your covenants once a year. Um, sometimes there's a tangible net worth ratio. Just depending on um, the size of your business and the risk that your lender has taken, you may or may not have covenants. So I think it's important to know if you have covenants on your other debt, because your PPP loan might have caused a violation unintentionally. So what I mean is sometimes when you have a line of credit or you have a banking relationship with a certain bank, just so I don't call anyone out, we're going to call it Robert's Bank because he's on the phone. So let's say all of your relationship is with Robert's Bank. You have your checking account there, you have your payroll account there, you have your line of credit with him, and you also financed your um, equipment and real estate debt with Robert. So in those documents, Robert might, Robert's covenants might say, you can't get a loan from anyone else without our permission. Or if you do get a loan from someone else, that loan, you know, it can't be collateralized. It can't, it has to be subordinated. There, there might be different restrictions that Robert's bank has placed on you because of your relationship. So um, the fact that you went and got a PPP loan, Robert's bank might be okay with, but it might have technically created a, a loan covenant violation situation that you're going to need to deal with. So if you have any covenants in your other debt, you might wanna just call and have a quick conversation with your lender and say, hey, remind me, what are my covenants? Just so you know, I got a PPP loan. Maybe it wasn't from Robert's bank. Maybe it was from Lisa's bank because you know Robert's bank's maxed out and you couldn't get one there. So you went over to Lisa's bank and Lisa's bank was able to approve you for a loan. Just make sure you're all okay with all of the lenders, that Robert's okay with you and Lisa's okay with you. Because um, you don't want to be in a situation where a covenant violation 
results in either your line of credit being called or you know they won't give you an extension on your line of credit whatever it is so just something to be aware of that, that no one was thinking about when they got a ppp loan right it's not in your memo um we were all just thinking about there's this program i need it i gotta get it um, but this could be a side effect of that okay let's talk about the unknowns that are out there i should probably speed up a little bit um the biggest unknown we have is with FTEs. So if you're familiar with the program, you know that you have to maintain your FTEs during the covered period, and that number has to be equal to or larger than a base period. And the two base periods, one is in the first half of 2019 and the other is in the first two months of 2020. So the question is, you know, if we do it all in eight weeks and we file under the eight week program, that's easy, right? Eight weeks, we're done, we move on. Um, Secretary Mnuchin made it clear that if you opt for the 24 week period, you can file for forgiveness. You don't have to wait till 24 weeks is over. However, they haven't get any, got, given any guidance on when you file before the 24 weeks is over, what does that do to your FTEs? Do you have to main F, maintain the FTEs the whole 24 weeks? Or do you get to quote, stop counting after, let's say you spent all the money in 12 weeks? and you wanna apply based on 12 weeks, are you allowed, <coughs> excuse me, to just stop counting your FTEs at the end of 12 weeks? It seems logical, I mean, to me, that's the logical answer, but they haven't given us any clarity on whether or not that's true. So the reason I think it's logical is if you've spent all the money in 12 weeks, you don't have any money left to maintain your FTE count in accordance with the program, right? And it would be unfair to you as a business owner to expect you to maintain your FTE count beyond the period during which you spent the PPP money. So that's kind of our opinion, <coughs> excuse me, but we don't have any what we're calling transition guidance, right? How do I actually file for forgiveness in less than 24 weeks? Um, so we're still waiting on that. Um, I'm kind of advising clients to, to try to wait for that answer um, even though it might take a while. But in the meantime, let's say you've spent all your money in 12 weeks. Here you are in week 14. You know, you're asking yourself, well, should I try to keep all my employees until I get the answer? And, and wholeheartedly, I think the answer is no. Whether or not you keep employees on staff or you let employees go should have nothing to do with the PPP program. That should be a business decision that you make based on what you need you know we have this many customers um, we need this many employees you know which is let's say that number is 20 currently we have 25 people you shouldn't hang on to five people just because of ppp you should make rational business decisions as a business owner um, so we've kind of been emphasizing that lately is you know make decisions that make sense forgiveness will take care of itself and I say that because mathematically, forgiveness will take care of itself. Um, you can get to 100% forgiveness even if you do have an FTE reduction. And I'll show you, and I'll show you how that can work. So if you got a $250,000 PPP loan, that means you had an average of 100,000 of average payroll costs per month in 2019. So let's say if, at, if in March things weren't going well and you had to lay off 20% of your people and you didn't bring them back, you made the business decision to not bring them back. So if your payroll costs are trending, now you only have $80,000 of payroll costs per month, right? So under the 24 week program, you're gonna spend about $480,000 on payroll costs. So the way the math works on the forgiveness application is you would report your payroll costs of 480. You have to reduce them by 80% to reflect the fact that you laid off 20% of your people. So I understand it's kind of a double, double whammy seems like, but so you now have $384,000 of allowable payroll costs. Well, remember your loan was 250. So you've more than spent the 60% required on payroll. So you're going to get 100% forgiveness, assuming you don't have that EIDL grant or advance, whatever you want to call it. And that's before we even count non-payroll costs like rent, utilities, all those other things that are allowed. 
So mathematically, you can work yourself to forgiveness even with an FTE reduction. And so we wanted just to point that out, that, that it helps in that you can start, you can make good business decisions with respect to your employees and not really have to worry about the effect on your FTEs. Um, so anyway, enough about FTEs. Let's talk about owners. So the interim final rule on June 22nd inferred that owner compensation is not just wages. It's wages, health insurance premiums, and retirement plan contributions during that covered period. And then it further said that owner compensation that you submit for forgiveness is limited to 15385 if you file on the eight-week program and 20833 if you file on the 24-week program. So when you're computing those limitations, you would not just look at wages, you would do wages plus health insurance premiums plus retirement plan. So that's a curveball that was thrown out that no one was really expecting. Um, because as you know, in, even though those things were factored in in the beginning, we weren't expecting, especially the 20,000 limitation on owners for the 24 week period. So there's still in the real no, really no clarity on is if you get to use those same three amounts when you compute the 2019 limitation. Because if you go through the math, you have to look at two different factors. You look at your 2019 compensation multiplied by a factor, and then you look at your 2020, and then you look at the limit and you take the smaller of all three numbers. Um, so that's kind of still an unknown as to what's out there. It can be a significant restriction on companies that have multiple owners. Um, it could be a situation where if they didn't have this limit, you would be able to file under the eight week period, get your application in and be done. But because of this restriction on owners, it may push you into the 24 week period, whether you like it or not. Um, there's all, they also haven't given us the definition of owner. Um, in tax law, there's always a definition of owner. It's, you know, a more than 2% owner or a more than 10% owner, whatever. They haven't defined owner. So until they give us a definition of owner, you kind of have to assume that's anyone with any ownership percentage. So if you, and I know this applies to a lot of businesses that are just starting out, sometimes you give ownership percentages to your employees in lieu of compensation, right? On the expectation that your business is gonna grow and then those employees will benefit somewhere down the line by you know, either cashing out their ownership percentage or when the business sells to a larger entity, if that's the plan, they'll you know, get money at that time. So even though those may be fractional shares or 1% or whatever, they're technically an owner. Um, so it could, you, end up with, you could end up with more people in that owner category than you really intend or consider, quote, owners. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. The last thing I want to point out about owners is that these limitations, and this is just a highlighted piece from the interim final rule, and look at this last sentence here, and I apologize for my ability, inability to draw a straight box, but um, this limitation is in total across all businesses. And the way I read that is if you have, let's say you have three businesses and you're an owner in all three, your combined request for forgiveness as the owner <coughs> is 20,833. So you have to break that up between all three applications. Maybe you take um, you know, 5,000 5, from this one, 5,000 from this one, and, and 6,000 for the, whatever the math is. Um, so that's something to be aware of if you have multiple businesses that receive PPP loans. Okay, more about limits. So um, the most compensation for an employee that you can submit for forgiveness is 15,385 if you use eight weeks, and it's 20,833 if you use 24 weeks. <clears throat> oh, this is the owner, sorry, and oh, 15,385 for owner, 2833, sorry, the next bullet. The employee compensation limits are 15,385 and 46,154. Is it a cliff? Is it prorated? Um, you know, are, meaning if you apply for forgiveness after 12 weeks, is your limit for employee compensation 46,154? That doesn't make sense to us. It, what makes more sense is that it's, you get 1,923 for each week of payroll that you're submitting. 
Um, but again, they haven't said if it's cliff or it's proration. So that's something to be um, aware of if you have more highly compensated employees. We still don't know what a transportation utility is. Um, I know when I spoke before, I talked about fuel being a transportation utility. Until we get clarity, and based on the math I showed you before, where you can get to forgiveness, honestly, in some situations without even including non-payroll costs, um, if it's questionable and you can get to forgiveness without using it, just leave it out. Um, then you have less, you know, less um, questionable items in your application. It's much more clean cut. You're just using what's exactly prescribed in the program. Uh, so that's something to consider. With retirement costs, we still don't know which retirement costs are eligible. So these are kind of the three options based on uh, the way the application reads. It could be 2020 retirement costs that are incurred and paid when due, right? Because the application allows costs that are incurred <coughs> as long as they're paid on their normal due date. Well, that gets nasty because the normal due date for a retirement plan contribution is the extended due date of the tax return, which is obviously in the subsequent year. So that one's kind of messy. Is it 2020 costs that are incurred and paid within the covered period? That would be like if you did a per, a per pay period match. So, um, you know, your employee contributes 6%, you contribute 3%, and you put that money in every time you do payroll. That's a per pay period match. Or is it what you accrued in 2019 that you paid during the covered period? We don't know the answer. Um, there's been no clarity on the answer. It could be all of them. It could be, uh, it has to be one of them. We just don't know which. So that's still out there as an unknown. The last thing I want to highlight is on taxes. So currently, as of today, because um, there is legislation to change this, the forgiven portion of the loan is not taxable and the expenses for which the PPP money was used are not deductible. Okay, so kind of let that sink in. We're in a situation where your expenses may hit in one tax year and the loan forgiveness income hits in another tax year. So that's kind of a double whammy because you're gonna lose that deduction in the first year. Um, and there's still a lot of questions about how that works and when is the loan forgiveness actually taxable. Um, and ultimately, Congress does not like this result. They're not happy with Treasury for <coughs> making this interpretation, excuse me. Um, so they are trying to introduce legislation to make the expenses deductible, which will kind of solve the problem. So it's something to be aware of. Um, if you have R&D credits, which I know um, a lot of start out small businesses try to take R&D credits, um, or if you're a pass through entity and you have to compute QBI, what does non deductible payroll do to those programs? We don't know the answer. Um, technically, non deductible expenses don't qualify for the R&D credit. So, you know, it's kind of like a further whammy. So, um, how, so then also, how do you compute your projected taxable income in your quarterly estimates if right now the system is this, but Congress is promising you this? Uh, especially if you're a fiscal year filer and your tax return extension is due in the next couple months, what, what are you supposed to do? So if you're a fiscal year filer, you, know, you might wanna consider an extension. That might be your best bet. Extend your return and then hope it all gets worked out before the final extension the final uh, filing date. And we're talking about 2020 tax returns here. You have to decide how to compute your estimates and extension payments. Are you gonna use the rules as they are now? Or are you gonna compute hoping that the expenses will be deductible? Um, that's a business owner and a business risk decision. You know, you kind of just have to weigh the factors. You could weigh cash flow. you could weigh what's the underpayment rate if you, if you go on the assumption that assuming expenses will be deductible and they end up not being, and you're underpaid, you know, how much extra um, underpayment penalty will you pay? So those are all things you kind of have to think about and decide what makes the most sense for you. And you can discuss those with your tax advisor. Okay, let's talk about documentation. When you submit your application for loan forgiveness, they're gonna expect documentation of everything, as of right now anyway. Like I said, Rubio's trying to reduce the burden. 
Um, but I think even if they do try to re reduce the burden, they're still going to expect you to maintain all of this documentation, even if you don't submit it to the lender or you don't submit it to the SBA. So you need to still be calculating your FTEs, gathering all your payroll reports, gathering all your statements for any non-payroll costs you're going to submit. And then the second thing they're looking for is verification of payment. So not only I want to see your utility bill, I want to see either the canceled check, which of course no one gets anymore, or you know, the line item on your EFT on your bank statement where it shows, you know, paid to SRP or whatever. Um, so those are so as you're doing this and you're tracking your costs and you're paying your bills, just put a copy of all that documentation in a file. Paper or digital, I like paper, so I would do paper, but that's just me. Um, eventually, it's all gonna be electronic in some way, shape, or form, um, but if you'd like to start with paper, there's nothing wrong with that. But just do it as you go along so that you're not having to, when your lender says, hey, are you gonna file for forgiveness? And you say, oh yeah, I better get that together. You know, that's gonna be a headache and you're gonna have to carve out a week of your life to go back and do it all. So just do it as you go along and gather that documentation. Um, the document retention period for this program, and this is an excerpt from the application instructions itself, and you can see it says the borrower must retain all such documentation in its files for six years after the date the loan is forgiven or repaid in full. So if you do end up where you in a situation where you don't get 100% forgiveness, like because of that EIDL grant, it would make sense to try to repay the loan as quickly as possible because that's when the document retention period clock starts. Um, so that's just kind of a little bit of advice on document retention. But six years is a really long time. So if you have a normal practice of moving your stuff to storage or whatever, or you have a, um, you destroy things after a certain number of years, don't destroy the PPP stuff. Um, keep it separate with your permanent records, like your minutes, your legal documents, your business formation documents. Keep it all together and keep it at least six years. Um, the application was revised on June 16th. There are two versions, a regular and an EZ. And the link to get those is right there in the presentation. Do you qualify for the EZ? A lot of businesses are gonna qualify for the EZ, but not everyone will. Um, the criteria is on page one of the EZ instructions. Basically the three criteria are, the first one is um, a sole proprietor with no employees. So that might get um, a lot of people. The second criteria is a business who did not reduce wages by more than 25% and did not reduce their FTE count over the covered period. Um, so it gets back to why the FTE count is really critical, right? Because if depending on how you measure that can determine whether or not you, you are eligible for the easy form. The third item, <coughs> excuse me, is a little more interesting. Um, it relates to reduced business activity. So what it says is you can qualify for the easy if a, you did not reduce wages below 25%, or more than 25%. So that's really key. You can see that SBA really wants you to not reduce people's wages. Um, so if you didn't reduce wages more than 25% and you had reduced business activity, you can qualify for the EZ form. So let's take a look at an example of what, they, what that means to them. So the example they give is you have a retail, I'm just gonna read it because it's probably easier than me just explaining it. A PPP borrower is in the business of selling beauty products, both online and a physical location. During the covered period, the local government, where the store is located, orders all non-essential businesses, including the borrower's business, to shut down their stores based in part on COVID-19 guidance issued by the CDC in March. Because the borrower's business activity during the period was reduced compared to its activity before February 15th, Due to compliance with COVID requirements or guidance, the borrower satisfies the Flexibility Act's exemption and will not have its forgiveness amount reduced because of a reduction in FTEs during the covered period. If the borrower in good faith maintains records showing the reduction of activity and copies of the local government shutdown orders that reference a COVID requirement or guidance as described above. So if you think you fall in this category, meaning your FTEs are down, but you couldn't help it because some government authorities, state, local, or otherwise, 
said you couldn't open or said you can only operate at 50%, whatever, you can qualify for this um, exemption and file the EZ form and not be penalized for a reduction in FTEs. What I think is important to point out here is that this is only for businesses whose activities were directly affected by a COVID order. Um, retail is a good example, restaurant, um, anyone deemed non-essential that such that they had to close and it affect their revenues. Now who would not qualify for this? A business who um, was either deemed essential or their reduction in revenues are an indirect result of the fact that the economy was suffering. So <clears throat> for example, let's say um, you have a professional services firm and you didn't, you know, you weren't, you weren't um, told to close your doors, you're able to work from home, but your revenues went down because there was a decline in the need for your services. Okay, that's not what we're talking about here. That's an indirect, unfortunately, an indirect result of what was going on in the nation. It wasn't a direct result of a COVID requirement for you to shut down. Um, so I think that distinction is important when you're looking at whether or not you qualify for this exemption and can file the EZ form. So anyway, okay, I didn't get done as fast as I want, but we still have 15 minutes um, for questions if anyone has any. And I pulled up the question now I'm not seeing any. My are there questions, Robert? There are a couple questions in the chat. Um, okay, let so me see. One is from Holly. It says, "What can I use PPP money if I use home just for business operations? I have a pet sitting business that oh, does okay. business in clients' homes." Okay. So the answer is you would only be able to use the money for items that are deductible on your tax return. And they would be items that you've taken as a deduction on your tax return previously. So um, if in 2019, you did not take any deductions for your home, then you can't, you, you can't use the money for those items in 2020. Um, in other words, what they're saying is like, my husband works from home now. He did it before. He works for a defense contractor. Um, you know, he can't, we can't take deductions on our personal return for our home expenses just because he's working from home now because of the pandemic. Um, and that's because we didn't take deductions for that previously. And the same applies to any small business. So if you've always taken deductions for certain things with use of your home, and I know those are really limited now anyway, um, there's a lot of restrictions on taking deductions for a home office. So you wanna make sure you look at those. But if you didn't deduct it in 2019 or 18, you're, you can't use it in 2020. All right, uh, Brian asked a question and I'll answer this one real quick. Um, it was about uh, Scottsdale. Brian, uh, for Scottsdale, if you search Scottsdale Virtual Small Business Assistance Center, um, it will pull up some information on the Scottsdale website regarding what they use some of the funds for and how to get assistance in Scottsdale. Um, I think we have some questions now in the Q&A box. Okay. Sorry, during the filing period from now, oh, Carrie Ann, you froze up. eligible amount oh that's a highly technical question let me think about that carry on you froze on that so we missed most of it <laughs> most of the you're reading the question we missed most of that okay sorry am i back yeah you're back okay sorry so i'm answering if you can see the q a i'm going to try to address the question from david graff when small businesses file this year's return they determine their loan received forgiveness was actually dispersed by a lower amount than was eligible I think once the PPP loan is whatever dispersed by loan, money, I think what you're asking is if we were eligible for a two hundred thousand dollar loan, but for some reason we only got one hundred and fifty. I think it's just one hundred and fifty. There's no deferred tax assets and liabilities with that. Um, whatever loan you got is whatever loan you got. 
Now there are situations where people applied for a loan in April based on what they thought the program was. And then later, like two months later, when the SBA finally issued guidance on how to apply for a loan, they realize, oh, I didn't include some stuff. I would have been eligible for a larger loan. You can go back to your lender and ask for more money. That's been clarified um, multiple times. So if you're in a situation where if you would have done the application today, you could get more money than you actually got, you can go back and get more because there's still money available and the application window is still open. Um, but I don't know that there's any situation where there'll be deferred tax assets or liabilities related to PPP. Uh, would you repost the sites to download the PPP forgiveness forms? All right, I can, <laughs> did you post those? Uh, yeah, Carrie Ann, I just posted the SBA's PPP okay. website link in the chat. So, so Richard, check out the chat. There's a link to the PPP page and it has the instructions and application form. Um, just a reminder on that, your lender may use a different application form, but the content should be basically the same. Right. I think our expectation is those lenders that have a portal, they're gonna figure out a way to do it electronically, but ultimately the information that they're asking for has to align with those SBA forms um, because what they submit to the SBA has to align with the SBA forms. So it might look a little different, but it's gonna be the same information. All right, uh, we don't have any questions right now. I, I know there's people out there with questions. Please uh, post up your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we've got a few more minutes. We want to take advantage of uh, Carrie Ann's expertise on this subject. Right, I'll answer questions about anything. Um, anything PPP related, I should say, I should clarify. <laughs> I had one client ask me if they should even bother with the non-payroll costs because it, you know, takes a lot more documentation with respect to, you know, documenting your rent, getting a copy of the lease, um, documenting that was actually paid, showing the copy of the canceled check or whatever. Could they apply using just payroll costs? And the answer to that is yes. Um, and payroll costs is the easiest to quote prove, right? Because you've got your payroll register that shows your gross wages and all your employees right there. So if you wanna kind of take a, what could be viewed as a more simple approach, you could definitely just fill out your application using payroll costs and ignore all the other stuff. Um, but if you're, if you're in a situation where you need the non-payroll costs, then by all means, of course. Uh, do I just go to my local bank and apply for the loan? Yes, so that's where you need to start. So if you have not received a PPP loan, you wanna start with the bank that you have a relationship with. Many of the lenders are only working with um, their current customers on the PPP program. There's other lenders, especially some of the smaller local banks that are not holding that requirement so that you could go um, you know, to a, a different bank and get a loan, a PPP loan with them even though you don't have a checking account with them. So start with your lender, or sorry, start with your local bank that you work with normally for your business. And if they say, um, you know, we're not doing PPP loans, they might give you um, a list of other local banks that are working with uh, not quote non-customers for that. Are the forgiven PPP funds going to be taxable? So that's a question that currently the, the loan fund forgiveness is not taxable, but the expenses that you spent the money on are not deductible. So mathematically, it basically just means that if you consider the expenses deductible, the loan is taxable. Um, so right now it's not ideal because it's, it's not taxable, but your expenses are not deductible and that's not what anyone wants. Um, there, will be, there will be legislation introduced to try to change that um, but that's what I was saying. You kind of have to, when you're looking at your 2020, you can either go with what it is right now or go with what you hope it's going to be when you're looking at your estimated tax payments and your extension payments for 2020. Let's see. Okay, what percent of deductions do I use? Last year I did percentage of square foot of office space. So I think this is the home office question. 
So you would want to do what you've always done for your tax return. So if you have a dedicated home office or a home space for your business and you've always used 20%, you would want to continue to use that. Um, there's definite guidance in the interim final rule specific to sole proprietors that says whatever you've done before, that's what you need to do now. You can't change things just because you got a PPP loan. Um, let's see. I'm a sole proprietor with no employees. Would I qualify for the EZ you mentioned? Yes. And basically a sole proprietor with no employees would want to file on the 24 week program, which would give you um, the maximum amount of forgiveness, which is 20,833. And, and that's actually the easiest application, a sole proprietor with no employees, because all you do is attach your 2019 Schedule C and your forgiveness is gonna equal line 31 um, divided by 12 times two and a half um, for a sole proprietor with no employees. So if you haven't done your tax return, you need to get your tax return done because the um, forgiveness amount for all Schedule C filers is going to be based on your 2019 Schedule C that you file with your tax return. Does it matter if I got the PPP loan through my personal bank or through a broker? No, it doesn't. Um, that has no impact on anything. There were lots of different types of lenders that kind of jumped in and got approved for PPP loans. Um, so I know a lot of companies who got PPP loans from online um, companies like Lendio and I don't know Robert if you can think off the top of your head about some of the online companies that jumped in. Uh, PayPal, Lendio, Square, um, those are the main ones I know of. Um, QuickBooks loans, uh, they have a, a lending arm of QuickBooks. They were also doing PPP loans um, and I'm uh, imagining that they're forgiveness process will be all online just like their loan process was. Right. So, um, so one of the things is, is being ready to wrap up. If you have still not received a PPP loan, uh, feel free to reach out to me at the Arizona Commerce Authority and I can guide you to a few different lenders that are still processing them. Um, a lot of the big banks, a lot of banks have stopped processing new PPP loans, um, but there are a number of, of CDFIs, community development finance institutions that are small local lenders that are, are still doing them. And so I can guide you to some of the Arizona ones that uh, are, are local and can help you out. Um, Carrie Ann, any final closing thoughts as we wrap up? Um, I don't think so. The one thing I would say, and we're advising our clients of the same thing, is they, I wouldn't rush to forgiveness. Um, I know you're, quote, over it. You just want to be done. Um, but we're, we're kind of telling all of our clients to try not to rush the process. Um, for one thing, there's legislation out there that might change how it's going to work. So especially if you have a loan below 150000 um, the odds are something really favorable is going to come out for you and it's going to reduce the paperwork. It's going to change how you apply for forgiveness. Um, so it's worth the wait because I think it's going to be, it's going to be good for you. Um, if you have a larger loan, um, you want to wait because like some of the unknown questions I was talking about earlier with FTEs and owner compensation and, and what expenses are eligible. So, Knowing that we have a long time frame to work with here, um, just don't rush into forgiveness. Wait till you, you feel like you have all the answers. If, if you can, you sought out with your you know, advisors to make sure you have a good application. Reach out to your bank, make sure you understand their process and how it's gonna go. But you know, just don't rush in there. Um, Cause it's, if you remember the application process, it was kind of a hot mess. Um, and so is that going to be a hot mess on the back end? It might be. So do you want to be a part of the hot mess or do you want to wait until it kind of settles down and, you know, everything's kind of structured? That's a decision for yourself. But our, our advice is to not rush into it. Excellent. Thank you, Carrie Ann. We appreciate your time and expertise today. Uh, attendees, thank you for your questions. Uh, good questions. 
and we appreciate everyone being here. Uh, we look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. We've got a great session tomorrow. Uh, please check it out, 9 a.m. on Friday, and uh, we'll see you then. Have a great day. Thanks. Thanks.